something out. Think about intuitions. Everybody has them. Right? Not just Christians. Right? This is part of the ordinary human equipment. Everybody has intuitions. Also, bad people have intuitions. Right? Hitler was a very intuitive thinker about politics. Really good at it. Right? So, good people, bad people, everybody has intuitions. What matters, of course, is the form of the heart that does that has the intuition. Right? If your heart is shaped by the Holy Spirit, by the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, right? then you will have a different set of intuitions than a wicked person. You're, think of the intuitions of a kind person. That's one of the fruit, fruit of the Spirit, right? the kindness. The intuitions of a kind person will be insightful. Right? Kind people are not dumb. They're, they're, they're tuned in to how people feel. They will respond to people differently than a cruel person or an indifferent person. And their prayers will be different. And the thoughts that arise in their hearts when they pray will be different. It's still their thoughts. The thing about the fruit of the Spirit is it's still our thoughts. It's our heart that the Spirit is shaping. Right? Um, that's what God wants. He wants us to be people who are wise, kind, joyful. Right? He wants His children to be people that He can say, Ah, have you seen my servant Job? Right? As he says at the beginning of the book of Job, have you seen my servant Job? Plainless and upright. That's what he wants. So that the intuitions of our hearts, even though they're our own intuitions, become holy. So we can still pray according to our own intuitions, we just need to stop calling them God's voice? Yeah. Okay. In a nutshell. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. That puts it very, very well. Thank you. I feel like one of the areas this might come from is where it says in the Bible, I no longer live with Christ lives in. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of sense in the Bible that you should be giving away what it makes you you. I know, I know that's not right. You should be giving away what makes you you in the sense of putting God in that place. Yeah. So how does this fit into that? Ah, uh, yes. Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of God. So Christ dwells in our hearts by faith as we pay attention to what is outside of us. Right? To Christ. Um, but this is not a form of self-annihilation. Right? This is a form of love. Right? It, it's like a bride waiting for her bridegroom. And she loves to hear news of his coming. She says, oh, he's almost here. Yes! yes. And that forms her heart. So that Christ dwells in her heart. Um, um, oh. The thing about giving God control. One of the impulses that some people have is to try to deny that they have a self. The bride does not try to deny that she has a self. She wants to unite herself to this beloved other. Right? It takes two to make a marriage. Right? If you try to annihilate yourself, you're not a proper bride. Right? Because the bridegroom loves his bride. He wants her to be there. He wants her to be happy and joyful and wise and flourishing. But then there's this certain impulse which you get in some of the mystical traditions that say, I want to be nothing. Oh, to be nothing, as one hymn says. Right? As if there's something wrong with being someone other than God. Right? As if God was wrong when he created the world and said, hey, that's good. It's good to be something other than God. Right? Again, it's that theme, if it's, if it's your own voice, then, then it's not worth listening to. Right? If it's your own decision, then it must be wrong. It's got to be God's decision. Right? You don't have a right to be there. You don't have a right to decide. You don't have a right to feel. Your feelings don't matter. Your decisions don't matter. All that matters is, uh, well, these voices that are, well, in your heart but not yours. And it's an attempt to annihilate the self and God. God created yourself. He doesn't want to annihilate. Right. Go ahead, Danny, and then. Okay, two questions. First, with the whole praying thing, and you said that we should pray with like psalms and commandments, are you saying that we shouldn't have our own words then as well? Sure, you, you, you can't avoid using your own words. I mean, our own like original prayers. But our sure. Okay. How could you not? You're there. Right. All right. You're there. Your words are there too. Other thing is, how does this all fit in with? Um, as in giving up control in our lives, how does it fit in with free will and what God already has with yeah. I think one thing about giving God control in life is you, you can think of it, if you, if you wanted to give it more credit than it deserved, you could think of it as a theological mistake about grace and free will. I don't think it's thoughtful enough to, be, to, to deserve that label, but you could think of it as someone who thinks that grace annihilates free will. Right? As if God's grace means that I don't make a decision. Right? Well, that's not what God's grace means. God's grace means that I learn wisdom and therefore can make good decisions and discern good from evil. It means that I learn kindness and therefore my intuitions are the intuitions of a kind person. 
Right? The fruit of the Spirit means that my heart is different. It doesn't mean that my heart is eliminated. Right? Here. I was wondering about what you think of the practice of a lot of churches after worship. They sort of have a time of Spirit-inspired prophecy from mm. the believers in the church. Uh, How does that line up with um, early early church practice, and what does that have to that's, do? That's an interesting practice, because it's hearing God's Word in a human voice, but not, not in your heart. Right? Um, the, this business of doing, well, it's really prophecy. There's a New Testament word for it, right? It's fairly clear that the New Testament churches had a practice of prophecy. Um, for instance, at one point in Acts, when they're about to appoint Paul and Barnabas to go on the first missionary trip, right? They're gathered in Antioch. There's a prophet among them, and the Holy Spirit says, blah, 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 you know, uh, set aside Paul and, and, and Barnabas. That's not somebody speaking in somebody's heart. That's a prophet speaking into the community, which is the way it happens in Israel, right? Now, the, the, the issue is, how do you discern the spirits? Right? The only way this works is if you have a mature community that knows how to discern the spirits, that can distinguish true prophecy from false prophecy. So that practice is a New Testament practice that requires great maturity on, a, on behalf of the church. Right? Um, and, and it is indeed the, the, the proper place to do it is in the church. Right? What you don't want is someone appointing themselves a prophet, setting up a website, you know, doing fundraising, and saying, I'm the prophet. And, and, like, so watch out for self-appointed prophets. Uh, and if there's going to be a way of doing this that works, it's going to be within the context of the church with, with real theological maturity. Yeah. Well, what about the situation of the person actually doing the prophesying? Mm -hmm. like, like, aren't they trying to hear God's voice in their heart or something? Well, it's never been described that way in the Bible. Like, how do you... How do you... But no one talks that way in the Bible. Never once does anybody in the Bible say, I listen to the word of God in my heart. But it's not just that. It's also that when we read the Bible, I mean, maybe it's because it's our individualistic society, or maybe it's because we thought that the main character in the story is me. Right? Yeah. So I'm we supposed to role play as Jesus when I read the Gospel. Or I'm supposed to role play as Isaiah when I read Isaiah. That is to say, if Isaiah is doing it, I should be doing it too. But that's not true. Yeah. And anybody who is made a prophet is made a prophet for the sake of the community. One of the things that's deeply unbiblical about the practice of hearing God's voice in your heart is that it's as if God is only speaking to you. That never happens in the Bible. Never, not once, does God speak within someone's heart just for that. Once there's uh, Elijah alone on the mountain, the still small voice, but that's outside his heart, right? And even Elijah is, is appointed as a prophet to others. Prophets are always, always anointed to speak to others. Right? That's how it works. And that's why this business of, of hearing the, the, the voice of the spirit in your own heart is perverse. You're listening in the wrong place. Uh, I don't know who was next. <laughs>